So uh, thank you again for, for joining this meeting. Uh, my name is Alex Blackburn and I'm a transport statistician uh, working at UNEC. I'm joined by my colleague uh, Miso Lihe and we have uh, various members of the um, transport and commuting statistics uh, subgroup uh, here with us, uh, countries, uh, international organisations, academia and the private sector. So it's great to have you here. I hope you can see my slides. Uh, if I could just have a wave from somebody. Yes, thank you Esperanza. Um, so the reason that we're having the call today is to take forward the work of the transport statistics uh, subgroup uh, and I'll give you some more details about that in uh, due course. Uh, but it's great to have so much uh, interest from countries on this topic. Um, so to start with, just a, a bit of background. Um, what we're part of is part of the UN Committee of Experts on Big Data and Data Science for Official Statistics. Uh, this is a organisation, this is part of UN Statistics in New York, uh, leading work on improving uh, access to big data and the use of big data for official statistics. Uh, some of you will be aware of the AIS data that is hosted and provided by uh, this committee. Uh, within this uh, committee of experts, we have a task team specifically on mobile phone data. And this is led by Esperanza at the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union. Uh, you can see the members of this uh, task team on screen. And here we have a nice mix of countries, international organizations and uh, NGOs as well. Uh, this task team is meeting about once a month to discuss, to discuss issues related to the deliverables, which includes handbooks that I'll talk about in uh, just a moment, in addition to events and other activities. And we've just had a, a large event on big data hosted by Indonesia last week. Um, so within this task team, we have several workflows uh, on things like tourism statistics, migration statistics, modeling uh, censuses and population estimates, uh, also using big data for uh, dis in, in a disaster context for displacement of people and also information society indicators. Um, so there's lots of different workflows uh, going on and for the purposes of um, transport, we don't need to reinvent the wheel here. So we have lots of different uh, workflows covering things like uh, confidentiality and access to the data. But on the transport side, so far the this has probably been the work uh, flow with the least progress so far, and we'd like to improve it. And so the idea is that uh, sometime in early 2023, we finish a handbook for using mobile phone data in transport statistics. So far, this is a um, very sketch uh, outline of a handbook that we have. And so what we propose to do is build the handbook around a certain numbers of, of uh, use cases that we've identified in transport. Uh, those are modeling public transport passengers, um, road traffic statistics and producing origin destination matrices on the road network, um, walking, cycling and active mobility, and also less on the official side, but um, on the side of official statistics, but more on use for transport planning and urban planning in general. Um, there's certainly a number of uh, all the existing use cases for mobile phone data in transport, but the focus and the emphasis with the handbook should be on official use case, uh, official statistics uh, whenever possible. Uh, within this uh, transport subgroup, um, we have a number of international organizations like the ITF, Eurostat, UNECA. Uh, we have uh, involvement from academia and we also have involvement from the private sector and NGOs. Um, we, we do have a number of countries that have uh, uh, are involved here. Um, Miso, can I just ask you to mute someone who might have come in? Thanks. Um, um, 
but we'd like to get more involvement from people uh, working on data in official statistics and ministries of transport. Um, so before I, I introduce our speakers today, uh, what we want to encourage is that we know that countries are to a greater or lesser extent experimenting with mobile phone data for transport statistics, uh, but we want to encourage you to share your experiences with us, both on the positive side and the less successful examples, because I think there's a lot of countries here uh, at the early stages of um, their work in using MPD for transport statistics, and they might feel a bit reluctant to share this with their peers, but we think it's important for um, countries to come together and share their use cases and share their experiences so that we can all benefit from uh, their experiences. Um, we have two great speakers today, um, but at, at the end of uh, their presentations and after any questions, uh, we want to encourage you to share your experiences, encourage you to suggest any additional use cases. Um, we will be looking at the other uh, use cases in future webinars, so you're welcome to present at these. And finally, we'd love to get you involved uh, in the work of this transport subgroup so that we can uh, produce a very high quality manual and uh, provide a space for countries to share their experiences. Um, before I hand over to our speakers, just a note on housekeeping. Uh, please do stay muted for now, uh, but feel please feel free to use the chat function for any questions. And this is a informal meeting, so please feel free to share your experiences um, and be active. Uh, before handing over to the speakers, actually, could I um, just ask uh, our co-lead on transport, Latifa, to say hello and introduce herself as well. Latifa. Hello, everyone. This is Latifa from the Road and Transport Authority. Uh, heading data management here and then uh, thank you Alex for a great uh, uh, introduction for the task team and we'd love to as, as Alex mentioned and and SP our chair is also joining us we had a great meeting and a lot of people wants to join uh, the work that we're doing in the task team so I urge all of you this is a very informal team it's a great community uh, we've learned a lot through through over the years and sharing knowledge methodologies learning and you have a group of, of, of uh, partners and colleagues here from around the world. So we'd love to see you all after this workshop to, to join our task team and looking forward to working with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Back to you. Perfect. Thank you, uh, Latifa. Um, so we have two use cases that we want to explore today. Uh, so two examples of the use case of using mobile phone data in public transport statistics. Uh, the first example comes from the Netherlands and Matthias Offermans will be presenting their experiences um, in using public uh, in using transport data in using mobile phone data for producing transport statistics where they're at and where they see the future. Uh, Matthias, did you have any look in sharing your screen or would you like me to uh, share the I slides? I think it's, it should work. Let's uh, let's give it a try. Thank you. Perfect. One moment. <laughs> I think I'll solve all the issues. Yeah, it's working, I guess. And um, thank you very much. So uh, I want to give you an introduction on uh, the use of mobile phone data in the Netherlands. And um, as you see, I, we have some issues in what is uh, uh, people displacement and what is mobility. So we get into definitions. So that's always our specialty from our, our offices, but we get this into a discussion. If you have any questions or comments, please uh, let me know, but maybe we should do it at, uh, at the end of the presentation. So, um, uh, and part of the presentation, some sheets are the same. I also have to put that disclaimer as uh, the very nice meeting uh, we had in, um, uh, in Indonesia, where, where part of this presentation also was shown. So uh, mobile phone data, it looks like new, it looks like innovation, but uh, in our office, um, we see it like, okay, we had a census, then somebody thought, hey, we have administrative data, and then there is big data. And, and what you see is throughout history, this is one of the oldest statistics looking at counting people, census information, 
And then, um, of course, looking also at a public displacement and then the next step is mobility. And um, I think that's a very important thing to, to remember because many pe people see this as, OK, this is just a nice gimmick, but I see it as a new way of, of uh, just a normal development in, in society. Um, before we want to talk about mobile phone data, we all know the, the, the issues. So in the Netherlands, we use we do experiments and, and, and look on research for, for mobile phone data since 2009. And um, during this uh, time, we had all kinds of issues. So of course, there's the legal aspects, there's privacy regulations, there's telecom laws, intellectual property rights. There's a lot of legislation things you have to organize. Then getting access to the data, of course, is an issue, as we all know. Um, and then this is also really important to mention. Um, and so this this is also why we are sitting together. I think working with mobile phone data is too complex to do everything on your own. So you need more parties involved. So you need, of course, MNOs, but you need an official statistics community who gives up, uh, you know, also who explains about quality checks, academia, and of course, the private sector is also involved in this. And then uh, you also need a multidisciplinary team, as we know. So you need not only legal people, but you need people from methodology. The IT is quite challenging, uh, the legal things. And then project management is also a very uh, delicate thing because you have so many parties involved. And then IT performance is crucial, as we know, especially with 4G and 5G. In the Netherlands, we have more than 1 billion records a month we, uh, we needed to process. And if you want to do a rerun, you want to do this in just one hour. And, uh, and and this takes a lot of uh, calculating power and especially also uh, good programming. And then uh, there's the last one, uh, and this was especially lessons first in the Netherlands. You also need a social license because when I started, we I started with census as an example, but we also know that um, that in census data, uh, people people don't like to be counted. You know, if you look at the US, there were a lot of protests against the US census. In every country, there are protests against census data. So you also have to realize that if you use mobile phone data, that uh, you need to work on, 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 on a social license. You have to explain why this is important, that you not track people, and you have to be on the very safe side of privacy. And this has definitely impact on the possibilities you can do for the data for mobility uh, statistics. So our approach was, of course, to do it simple, uh, to design a method that is universal and flexible. We do only process the data at the operator because we are limited because of legal uh, um, considerations. So, so that's an important principle for us. We have a modular system that allows all kind of plugins uh, to add and, 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 and to change things. And that this makes development faster, but also makes it more useful for other subjects. Um, and th then, of course, we also looked at the, the, the input because you have several operators. Some operators only have 3G data and some have the, the latest Asian hardware, which, which involves 5G. And and and, uh, uh, and this makes a difference. So uh, you have to think about software that can handle all these kinds of data. So um, our method uses uh, dynamic input, and it's um, and this can of course depend. So it can be two G, it can be four or five G. Uh, it eats everything if as long as it's event based geolocated geolocated data. And uh, the. There are two kinds of data sets you need. First, of course, you need the, the dynamic input, but then, of course, you also need maps, uh, reference data. Where are the antennas, but also use of the soil, where are the roads, and this kind of thing. And then we come to another principle that also is because of, uh, we use everything, all data is based on grids. So this is different than in mobility statistics, because there it's based on cities and roads. And here we use a, a 100 by 100 meter grid base that is adjustable for depending on the quality of the data. So sometimes it's one kilometer by one kilometer, but uh, it can be very detailed. And then um, you also need to gross it up and, and, and correct it because nobody wants to is interested in the population of the operator. You want representative results, and that's why we use census data or register data to, to add it. And this is also the added value for us as an official statistical office. 
uh, if it was just processing mobile phone data without any registrations or any any waiting system, yeah, everybody could make the statistics. But I think by incorporating administrative statistics and many other sources, um, yeah, you end up at the statistical office and official statistics. OK, and then we get to the sensitive part about mobility. Um, it's all about space time metadata. No, uh, sorry, I put here a, a type in it. Metadata and no direct data. So we are not interested in person goes one to uh, location one to location B using a, a railroad or a train using this mobility modality and then having the timestamps and then, OK, draw a line and, and add up this. So this is not the way we do this. We want to have indirect metadata and we add properties by using maps or using a machine learning model uh, to, to find out what is actually happening. Uh, but this is a, a big problem for mobility, official mobility statistics, because we have models based on surveys and we use them for decades and we refine them and we made them really perfect. So the bad message is if you want to use these data, you, you need to look at a different paradigm and you need to change the model. So this is the problem. Um, and the reason why we have this paradigm system is because of privacy and, and technical limitations. And I will get back to you soon. I think this is important. So um, for us in the Netherlands and also I think in Europe, tracking of people is not done. So you can't track individuals and then just add up because this is uh, always, even if you aggregate them, you can always calculate back who it was uh, for using advanced methods. So we do we don't use any root collection on an individual level because we think that roots always lead to identification. And I never saw a method. And we, if you have a method, I'm very interested. But until now, everything could be hacked in a method that we're using root. So we don't use any root information in this uh, in this way. And modality, if you're going on foot or a bike, uh, then you can use geofencing analysis. So in some areas, uh, there's only uh, railroads. Some areas it's combined. You see railroads combined with, uh, um, uh, uh, with uh, normal highways. And you have areas where there are only highways and no railroads. So we use these kinds of map to distinguish uh, modality. Uh, we did this in the past. It, we, we didn't incorporate it in our last uh, research. And then we have this idea. So if you know where people are, and you can count them and, and make estimates on, on the count. That's more important. We don't exactly count them. Then you can also add properties. And these properties can be derived from the metadata. So I'm not interested in individuals, but in how they behave and, and have to have certain mobility patterns. And from these patterns, uh, I can use machine learning algorithm all to determine home location. I can use an algorithm to, to see if this is a tourist. I can use an, um, of course, you can also see directly from the data if it's a tourist in the roaming data, of course. But you can also see if this is a tourist or a commuter, because and, and this you can't see directly from the data. So this is where properties are being added using a machine learning modeling uh, or simple other algorithms. Um, so, uh, but the, and, and, and then, okay, then you would say, okay, it's not interesting anymore for mobility analysis, but yeah, well, I think that you have a very high resolution, especially in less dense areas where you don't have any other sensors like traffic loop data or, and, and what is also very interesting, the things you miss in, in survey data, like peak detections or sudden changes in, in movement. So you see all the extremes, you have a complete picture and overview. So, so this is important. Um, so, um, and, and this is, of course, the grid uh, type of modeling we use. So we, and everything is, is in the end translated in pixels uh, of a map, you can say. And we use multiple layers to, to combine these maps. So uh, just to give you an, an, an overview of, the, of our method, this is our method uh, and the modules we use. So, uh, and I will give you a short introduction to this. So uh, we call this the nine steps, and this is not in our official documentation, but it was actually also a joke because you have the nine uh, steps going to hell in Dante's uh, <laughs> Comedia, and it was a very struggle to develop this method, but it's also a protective method. So these nine steps are actually there to, to protect privacy on every level. So first of all, we have the source data. Everybody knows source data, but there are a lot of different kind of source data using mobile phone data. So you need to find a method to deal with all this kind of, of source data. You have CDR outgoing, incoming, 
uh, you have signaling data, you have uh, location area update. Um, uh, you also have something that's called timing advance, which is only in 4G and 5G, which is a direct estimate of the distance uh, to the antenna. So these are all kind of different data types that depending on the operator stores or doesn't store it. So, uh, so um, there is not simply something like mobile da phone data. There are different uh, event-based geolocation data. Um, so when we start to work on it, then we have a standard pseudonymization of the MZs, which is usually already in place. And then we do an extra pseudonymization with random keys, which makes uh, identification already on site at the operator very difficult. So this is an internal protection. So this is the first step uh, we do. And then we have a special uh, package. It's called uh, Moblock. Everybody can download it. It's, it's an R written. And it uses raw signaling data as input data and uh, static data for maps. And the output is an antenna to location uh, CSV output. And I'll explain later what we do with this. And it's a quite state-of-the-art uh, package where we use all the radio modeling of 4G and 5G with the angle, the antenna, signal strength. So we have something like 20 parameters, depending on what the operator has. You can add this just to come up with a very accurate uh, geolocation uh, data. The standard is output is 100 by 100 meter grid, which is uh, dynamic. So for areas where you have less people, you can make it bigger. It's, uh, it has a visual, visual dashboard to adjust all kinds of algorithms. It also supports uh, very frequently updates because some operators uh, update their antenna maps every 24 hours. Well, this tool supports this. Uh, it also has special validations tools, so you can ask your colleague researchers, OK, uh, do you want to give informed consent to look really deep into your detailed call detail record uh, data and use this as a validation data set? So there's also a, a thing. And there is timing advance uh, data support. Not every operator has this type of data, uh, but if you can do this, you can uh, get back to, I think, almost like 50 meters uh, accuracy. So this is quite... Um, uh, accurate uh, uh, estimation uh, uh, way of estimating, making estimates. But we're not really interested in pinpointing uh, it to people. Let me see if yeah, it's working. So this is uh, how Moblock looks like. It's, uh, it creates all these antenna maps. It shows the 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 the, the site uh, of the elevation and the azimuth. Uh, and it gets all these coverage maps. So this is the coverage merge map we created, and this is the coverage merge map of the supplier of the network. And then you can see, okay, are we correct? And, and see, can we do it better than even the supplier of the network? So you can here uh, adjust everything on the network and make it very uh, specific and, and to come up with good estimates. So the whole idea also behind this is a Bayesian estimate. So for example, I'm today at The Hague, and my colleague is also at The Hague, but there's also a, a smaller municipality here, which and the border is really close to the office building. So in our estimation, we would say that I'm for 50% in this municipality, and my colleague is also for 50% in this municipality. So together, we count this as one. So this one person, it look, we count one person, but this one person is an estimate, and it's by design already in this step anonymous. So, so that's uh, really important to know. So um, so we have the signaling data. I just explained to you something about mob location, this module. We also have another mob module, and this is more properties. And this means, so you have a location and you have time, that's interesting. But what if you can get more information, like uh, where somebody lives? Now, one algorithm for uh, home location can be, okay, the antenna where you make most of the time a connection myth. Okay, this can, you can translate to a simple algorithm and you can add this in this module as a more property. And in the end, we combine this, but I will get this uh, later. So adding uh, properties uh, makes it very interesting because you can filter for machine to machine, or maybe you are very interested in machine to machine data because at, at some areas you have like automated cars or um, but of course, home location is very important. Uh, we did some research also on working locations to find out where you can add this. Um, so you can add all kinds of properties here and then experiment with it and see uh, if it comes out. 
what we did was we also we looked at of course home location and in our research we also looked at the point of entry for uh, tourism where yeah, people enter the, the the country for example is it by plane is it by car uh, and um, we also used machine learning to see are people tourists or are they actually commuters because in the netherlands you have germany very close by you have the united kingdom which is uh, quite close you have belgium uh, and are these people working here or are they tourists? And if they are tourists, are they shopping tourists? Are they cultural tourists? So, so we did some experiments there also on, on machine learning data. So this is the more properties module. And then you combine this, and this is where the IT trick here gets into part. So you get into mob cube and um, it's a one way process. So you also can't go back, which is another uh, addition for internal uh, privacy protection. And here the data gets aggregated to statistical information. That's really anonymous. And what it generates is an origin destination uh, cube. Uh, and it's a cube because you have origin destination. And the third dimension is time, of course. And the time can be every hour. I can set on 30 minutes, depending on the, the cell volume, how much data you have. And this is how the time cube looks like. So this is the time, of course. Sorry, this is in Dutch, but so this shows from uh, Eindhoven to Utrecht. At, the, at this time, there are 33,000 people um, coming from this municipality, living in Utrecht, but they are actually at this moment in Eindhoven. So you have the, it's just like a, a distance table, but then origin destination, uh, and then it's a, and then the time dimension. So you get really long and big tables. And this is also a, an issue for present, presenting your data because one table doesn't see anything. You want to look in the, the dynamics. So in the end, we also have an extra, and it's called Mob Safe. I'm not going into depth in that. Uh, you, if you want to see more, I can. You can read this uh, this online. Uh, the Mob Safe makes sure that all data that leave the office at uh, the mobile phone operator are really anonymous uh, because this is obligated by Dutch law. Uh, and this is a, a thing that's going out. It's an automated process that's also checked manually to see if the uh, process has gone uh, well. And then we get the data, which that are actually anonymous. We get them as a half product to at Statistic Netherlands. And this is interesting because, and, and it's not interesting. It's not interesting because it's not a representative population. It's also only representing the population of the operator. So, uh, so here we can do some corrections uh, for this based on uh, administrative data. And then we make relative values and then we get into presentations. So, um, of course, uh, we can share this presentation, but you can also here scan the QR code. Um, and we, we made some very nice visualizations. You can try them on your phone or here on your computer uh, where you can see incoming population or outcoming population for the Netherlands. Uh, just to note, the Netherlands is really small, 200 uh, miles or 300 kilometers, uh, 70 million people, very high dense uh, population. And uh, we made 450 municipalities and for every municipality you can click on it and, and see and see the, the dynamic pattern during the time, how many people are there and depending on the dates and see all kinds of special events. And you can do this for incoming, outcoming, you can so you look at the weather, all these things are incorporated in a, in a nice visualization. So this is a nice use case. Um, another use case is uh, looking at pedestrians, how busy it is. In the Netherlands, we have King's Day, of course, not during Corona, but now uh, everything goes back and everybody is, it's a national holiday in Amsterdam. And we did a nice study. Uh, it's also on our website and it's a nice use case to see, okay, how crowded is it really? Because according to the police, there are every year more people coming in. And what we found out that was actually uh, in the in the city center, the number of people is actually rising. But in the whole Amsterdam region, there was actually nothing happening. So what we discovered that is that during this uh, special day, only the behavior changed. So the number of the people are the same. <laughs> But the behavior of the people are different. It's, instead of being inside, being in schools and at offices at work, they are outside drinking beer and having a party, which gives a complete different picture of the number of people. But if you really look at the, the estimates, they are, it, it looks like a normal day. So, so this is also interesting uh, outcome from using mobile phone data to see no difference. Well, you know, there's a big party going on and, and, and everything happens. And this is showing this, this graph showing the exception of the city center. You see a little rise there of 
uh, 200,000 people. Yeah, so uh, a more classic presentation, uh, because if I show this at the office, people say, OK, now I want to have a normal graph. And then I always show them this graph. And, it's, and I also explained that this only has, has limited use. So this we made in 2013. So this shows Amsterdam. These are the people who live in Amsterdam and are actually staying in their own municipality. These are people who live in Amsterdam, but they went abroad to other municipalities. And these are the people um, who are uh, actually visitors. And these are the this, uh, this small bar are the tourists actually visiting Amsterdam. So this gives you also a very strange perception because if you look on the street, you see only you only see tourists and uh, many foreigners, <laughs> uh, but most are actually visitors from uh, the Netherlands themselves and 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 or actually people who live in the city. And this is also interesting because Almere, it's a city that is a sleeping city. So during the day, this is the, the number of the registrations. So um, at 12 o'clock, uh, there's nobody on the street because most people are working abroad. So, so this is a commuter town. If you would like to, to know more, I go really fast because I think we have some room for discussion. Uh, you can look at these uh, uh, links and they show very detailed how the method works and gives you also some more insights in, in, in use cases um, and discussions. Um, and um, yeah, I think what, what is interesting also about this project, and then I'm going to finish, is, um, is it, 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 it comes up with new problems. It gives new mathematical insights, also new IT insights. So we, we work together with the Institute for Mathematics in Oxford. Uh, it's very nice to work at different operators. So we as Statistic Netherlands work actually at the site of the operator and, and work there, there together. So this is our team. And uh, yeah, and, and this is also interesting. You need to work with many organizations, and then we also have our paradigm changes. So, uh, so this is my uh, my story on this. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Matthias. That was excellent. Uh, really interesting presentation. Uh, from my side, I was really impressed to see how much focus there is on privacy and the very complex model that you use to ensure confidentiality of the uh, of the micro data. Uh, I, th I think you um, were just answering it to, on your last slide. Um, my, my, my first question was going to be, um, does the mobile network operator do this pre-processing uh, anyway, or are they doing this because uh, CBS uh, asked them to? Uh, and if so, I mean, is this a, a question of goodwill or are you their customer? Uh, maybe you could start with that. Well, it's um, that's a very good question. I think um, if you look at operators, everybody has this image of a, of a greedy uh, company, of course, may, wants to make profit. But these are also really large size companies and they also see uh, their, their value for society. So they want to be responsible also for society and they want to also take care of their image. And for, for them, it was important to, to have two things. So first, there's benefit for society uh, because you can show, OK, you can do this for official statistics. You can use it for disaster management. We all know the example. So this is the good story. But it's for them also important to know their customers best. So they're, um, mo I, mostly I try to convince them that just selling the data, it's not a sustainable model because selling the data is just maybe they can have 1 million euros revenue out of that, which is just almost nothing because they have a revenue of 1 billion or 2 billion, uh, the huge companies. So why would they risk privacy just for such a small amount of money? So uh, so where they, what, what's for their commercially more interested is how to understand their own population. And what we did as a statistical office, we processed there and the software is open source. Of course, the software is also available for their competitors, but they are the first ones to use it. And, and we are actually learning them how to read and to write with all the data. We install them the, the Spark system because we also needed the Spark system for our own statistics. But of course, most of the time it's not running and they can use it for other cases. So ca they can do their own customer analysis on this and, and understanding the, the customer database. For us, it's, uh, it's a problem because we are not interested in their customers. We want to have representative outcomes. But this is also interesting because then they can 
with the weights that come out that shows how not representative their population is. They know what they are missing in customers. So this also gives them interesting insights. So this is the win-win uh, situation uh, for the operator and uh, we never paid anything for the data. So, uh, so this is our principle and, and we share actually knowledge and I think that's a very healthy model. And there's also a bit of competition on the on the scientist uh, field. So we have people from uh, the, the office at the operator because they understand their data, of course, best, which is also something we, you have to acknowledge as a statistical office because we think we are the best in making statistics. But uh, that they are, uh, so you can really combine this, but we are very good in getting a good quality framework, fixing uh, definitions uh, and these things. So um, I see this really as a win-win to serve private, uh, between private and, uh, and public sector. So this is how we did our research. Fantastic. I, I'd like to open the floor for questions now. Um, so please feel free to raise your hand and I can take any questions. Um, I see a question in the chat from Ayumi at the University of Tokyo. Ayumi, would you like to ask the question directly? Yes, uh, thank you very much. OK, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. OK, um, so thank you very much for the nice presentation. I would like to ask more about the partnership. Uh, so my question is, um, currently, regard, I understand that you're already producing the transport statistics from the CDR data. So are, are you collaborating with other institutions, such as um, the, some other government or agency or private sector that provide public transport services? And if we do, if you do, how do you establish the partnership? Uh, that's my question. Yeah, that's a very good Mat question. Mat 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 uh, before you answer, could I just take another question and then we'll we'll, we'll have you answer uh, um, uh, after that? Uh, Viviana, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, thanks, uh, Matthias. I I want to 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 know if uh, you have your work have been focused on on mainly on rural trips or interurban trips or also in, in urban trips because I have been working with urban trips and I have had many problems with many things that you have uh, now. So that's my very important question. Thanks. Maybe you could answer those two now, Matthias. He's frozen, I think. He's frozen. Frank, I don't know if you're in a room next to him. Could you go and give him a knock? <laughs> Matthias is in The Hague. I'm uh, in Heerle, but I'm going to call oh. him. Oh, thank you. He's coming back right now. Perfect, thank you. Hi, Matthias. Hi. Hi, sorry, the, the connection uh, dropped out. I don't know what happened. So. Did you catch uh, Viviana's question? Yeah, I, I, a part of it. So, uh, yeah. But, uh, so, uh, um, but it was about rural areas and that you had issues with, 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 with making good statistics on, uh, on uh, commuting within, uh, within cities. I didn't hear. Uh, The cut, um, I have my communication not so good also, so I couldn't uh, hear you the, the, the answer. 
So um, I, I'm just <laughs> I'm trying to repeat uh, your, your question. You ah, have my question. Okay, yeah. Maybe uh, uh, it's better if I ask you again. Maybe. Yeah. Please. Um, the thing is that I, I want to know if your work was mainly focused on on estimating uh, trips in in in, in rural areas or interurban trips, maybe because I have I have been working with urban trips with MNO data. And I have had many problems with many things of, of the things that you have described now. Mm -hmm. That's my question, because it's too different uh, estimating uh, trips in a city between, uh, uh, I don't know, um, uh, instead of doing in rural areas. So, yeah. That's okay. So uh, shall I start with the first question or are there more questions? Okay. Um, so uh, to start with the first question, no, we are not in production. So this is maybe very strange. We had everything finished for three operators and then Corona came and we thought this would be an excellent tool to use it for uh, Corona uh, statistics to look at people's density and to use this. And then we got issues into social license. So we got a very negative image in the in the public and a journalist wrote a story about it, which was not true, but he wrote a story that we were tracking people. Uh, he, they, they made some, uh, they had the idea that we were just uh, tracking people like the police does and of every individual. And this got, we got into so many trouble, even though the, the privacy was so sophisticated, uh, we had to stop our project. So, so that was very frustrating. So we had everything in place, even the validation of the, of the parts to make the first uh, data on population statistics and also uh, a very simple version of uh, tourism statistics. And uh, we had to stop it. And now we are still negotiating with, within politics, uh, with also uh, all kinds of specialists uh, to, to get this project up and running. But for now, we really had a, a big public image and if you look at, unfortunately, it's all in Dutch, but if you look in the Dutch news and look for mobile phone data, CBS, it says tracking people. It says that we were not respecting privacy, that people at the uh, that public officials of the statistical office were actually listening at the operators to telephone calls. Uh, so these kind of things were actually coming up. So the public made it a complete different image and we had to stop the project. Uh, so we're now trying to to reboot everything and um, trying to work on a standardization of the method and explain so so to keep up the knowledge. And in the meantime, we have discussions with legal specialists and also in, in politics to see how we uh, can restart uh, the project again. So uh, so this all happened during COVID. And uh, and of course, COVID are really strange times. And uh, with, the, with, the, with the knowledge of today, I would never have used COVID as a use case. So uh, yeah. So, uh, so this is actually uh, our current status. Um, yeah, we talk also talk. We also talk to uh, public um, transport uh, companies, but this is a different data source. In the Netherlands, we have a, a data source. It's called uh, uh, a chip data because every uh, user of public transport has a chip card, which is a national card, and we can use all these direct uh, data. We can actually use, and there's also they are also obligated by law to share these data and we're now setting up this this project so this is a different data source very specific for the netherlands um, uh, that we are going to use to make uh, public transport data statistics so for public transport data is an exception but of course in the end you also need mobile phone data to get the bigger picture so uh, also for for the other modalities and then um you get to the, the question of uh, viviana um Yes, there are very, there are a lot of differences also in the use of a mobile phone. So if people are being bored or standing in uh, recreating, they're using more data. And if they are more in economical regions, they are making more calls. So you can see all kinds of patterns uh, in certain areas. Um, we saw that um, mobile phone data have all have a lot of biases. So the first thing, if you look at mobile phone data, you think, hey, these are perfect administrative uh, resources because they're made by machines, but they're very polluted. They have all kinds of mistakes and timestamps and uh, GPS antenna differences. So you need a checklist before you even access uh, the raw data to look at this uh, systematically. 
of course, when you start, you're not doing this systematically, so it's basically trial and error. So that's why it's also important to share these experiences uh, in, in, in these kind of settings. Um, we didn't have much issues in getting good data and populations er estimates in rural areas, but it also depends on the, how big you make these areas. So if you look at neighborhoods, everything still goes well. So, but it's also maybe depending because the Netherlands is really a very dense population. Only Bangladesh has more people per square kilometer, so uh, so maybe that's also a, a, a different situation. So we have we have a lot of phones, and we have a high density of 4G and 5G uh, network, which delivers also really a lot of events. So a, a 4G uh, smartphone gives more than a thousand events per day per person. So then you have a lot of uh, geolocation uh, points also, and you can make accurate uh, results. And actually the the, the the accuracy of the geolocation really depends also on the antenna and the antenna design and the network. So sometimes you have an antenna that only has a, a field of 10 meters and then 360 degrees angles. And some antennas have just a two degree angle, but they go 60 kilometers. So, uh, and uh, yeah. I think the issues you talked, I think it would be very interesting maybe to, to look at this package. It's called Moblock and, and we solved many of the things and actually we, we were very own wise because we we got a lot of the technology of the deliverers from Sony Ericsson and from Huawei, uh, but in the end we we remodeled everything in our own model. So uh, yeah. and that was also have, what's happening. And, and a little thing, uh, did you have access to the overlap of the antennas of each connector, or or do you have you had just information of the antenna that the the the, the insert the the telephone um, made? It, it depends on the operator, but most cases, yes, we had antenna maps and we also had uh, coverage maps. Uh, but in the ideal situation for Moblock, you want just the specifications of the antenna. So you want to know the reach, the angle, and then you can fill in everything. But if you have less information, you can can also use it. But of course, then you come up to the less accurate uh, information. Uh, so it depends yeah. on what the operator has. And uh, But most of the operators, they all have their own coverage maps because that's standard from uh, uh, the, the problem is also that um, some, especially in the Netherlands, antennas are constantly moving also because sometimes uh, they're changing. So you need a 24 hour update, which is also technical, quite a challenge. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, lots of interesting uh, discussion uh, happening. Uh, maybe we can take the question from Esperanza, please. Yeah. Thank you, Matthias. I was about to ask the question about the sustainability and the implementation, but uh, you know you already addressed that. So now my question is about um, the use of uh, statistical law, how you know, in order to explain the issues that you have now to the public. I mean, do you see that as something that could help? resolve the situation that you have now because when we talk about mobile phone big data we always say there are three challenges which is just about access to the data which you manage to get and you, you don't have that you have resource with regards to infrastructure which you don't have an issue and you have staff uh, resources which you don't have an issue and we didn't foresee this problem of you know awareness and making sure that the public mm -hmm. are happy and and not you know, contradicting the objective of official statistics. And this is, for me, something new. And, and I think this is something that other countries should also learn and have a way of, you know, getting around the issue if in case it comes out. So do you think, you know, our traditional way of working as a statistician saying that, you know, official statistics is an obligation of a national statistics office, could this help explain to, you know, people who are against this work, um, yeah, I think we were very, we did an evaluation like, okay, how could this happen? What did we do wrong? Because obviously we did something wrong and um, because the public responded. And I think that with, the, with the knowledge of today, I can say that I think we waited a quite a while until we published because we have very high quality standards. We, so we thought we're not going to publish it. And then um, if the journalists found this out, they said we were doing this in secret. So you really have to be transparent of every step you do and make it proactive. Then also you have to make sure that there is no news to tell, you know. So if you already publish what you are doing, there's no news, you know, that's as you can see it on everybody can check it on the website. So that's the second thing to 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 be very transparent, even in the first uh, steps. 
Um, the third thing that was very difficult is privacy and the technical things. They are too complicated to explain to the general public. So, uh, so if you look online now, we have a, a manual for dummies, but it's still 15 pages. You know, who's going to read this? Uh, and then we have uh, the mathematical documents, but they are only uh, so. So this is only for the real professionals who who can understand this. Then you have also many. Uh, people who do not treat the data well. So you see also many academics who actually use roots. So yes, there are also examples of people using mobile phone data and uh, not treating privacy very well. And they use that as an example uh, because you're using also that. So that makes one and one is two for many people. So this is also a disadvantage of these, these data. Um, what we also see is that there are new uh, uh, there's a new field of people who like to hack aggregated uh, data. So we all know these articles in Nature, but now especially there were some very interesting uh, articles from China uh, about hacking aggregated origin destination uh, cubes based on direct calculations. Uh, and we also published uh, some information of that. But if you read, read these populations and you don't have any background, then you would say, oh, so none of the data is safe. So my privacy is not safe. No, I don't want this new data. <laughs> uh, and there is another thing. We are not doing this because we are data geeks. Of course, we like this, um, but we're doing this for society. And I think there are really a lot of issues. Like if there's a disaster happening, do we actually really know how many people there are? In the Netherlands, we have a very high density of cars. The population is very mobile. Uh, so in three hours, the whole population could go from one part of the country to the other part. Uh, 60% is below sea level in the Netherlands, so uh, so a disaster is always there, you know, but uh, we don't know how many people are there because people are at work and not at home, and administrative data only tells where people are at home and where they sleep, but not... Uh, you have um, all kind of dangers like uh, chemical trains or uh, factories or things that can happen, uh, and, we, and for me, I'm quite concerned because I'm seeing we have all these evacuations plans for safety and so on, but they're all based on administrative data where people sleep, which we all know they are not correct. Uh, if you look at um, tourism data, yeah, you miss Airbnb and all these kind of uh, platforms. Uh, it's not only hotel registrations that pay taxes, uh, which is very important because uh, tourism industry is a billion industry and for investments and banks, these statistics are really important. So I think we really should explain the story to, to the public of uh, that it's important uh, that we have these data and that we're not living in the Middle Ages anymore and that it's just a, a normal step. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, um, I'm conscious of the time. Uh, I don't want to uh, break up this great discussion. Maybe if there's more questions for Matthias, we can put them in the chat. Uh, one of the things I wanted to ask is, um, at the moment there's limited uh, use in official statistics in terms of origin destinations of people traveling during the day. Uh, what, is, what are the next steps? You know, how can this be used more thoroughly? But maybe you can think about that and uh, give me a, a response in the chat or uh, yeah. have it towards the end of the uh, webinar. Uh, maybe we can move to our next speakers now. Um, so we have Michael um, from Invenium Insights and we have Reinhard from OBB Austrian Railways. And they're going to tell about their, share their experiences on producing rail passenger statistics using mobile phone data. Uh, so Reinhard and Michael, um, over to you, please. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot also to to have the possibility to present what we are doing in Austria. It's a little bit different than what Matthias told um, in, in the Netherlands because um, we're still working with this data now around about 10 years, but we are still working with the data also um, in the area of products where we provide um, analytics results to, to different um, uh, customers, I would say, if the customer is a ministry, if the customer is a private organization, so a lot of customers in different areas and also in different branches. Uh, but what uh, we want uh, to show you today is uh, one use case which which uh, we are as an Invenium Data Insights doing together with um, the Austrian uh, railway operator ÖBB, um, together with A1, and A1 is, is the Austrian telco operator from the government. 
technical side um, and we are doing this together in a cooperation project and we want to show you today what what we are doing there in the public transport but at first only to give you an, an, an short uh, insight about what we are doing and what Invenium stands for um, and what Invenium is in a nutshell so I started round about 12 years ago 2010 uh, with the topic of using signaling data um, in the area of calibrating uh, traditional transport demand models. So I'm also at the Graz University of Technology. I'm a transport scientist and um, I started using different, emp different empirical data in case of uh, calibrate my models. So I'm really from this uh, macroscopic and microscopic modeling of transport where people are moving um, OD matrices and so on in this case. And um, I was looking for additional data and then I started with different uh, research project in using this signaling data. Um, and then we had also a big project in Austria between the years 2013 and 2015 uh, where we had the topic um, how this data should be anonymized and not pseudonymized, really anonymized in the way that it's not only usable for the research world in Austria, um, it's also for example also usable for the business world and this was such an idea and then uh, we made a spin-off of the Graz University of Technology and this is now called Invenium Data Insights at the end of 2016 and now we are around about six years um, on the market in Austria working together with A1, um, the telco operator in Austria. And what is also important, Invenium is a daughter now of the A1. So uh, the A1 is uh, the majority shareholder now. We are three people from uh, from the former founders, which are also shareholders of the company, but it's really now a company included, partly included in, in the telco operator here. And so the whole process, what we are doing is really providing at the end uh, of the day results based also on signaling data um, to, to different customers in different areas. So I think it's, it's also very important to know it's how the structure of Invenium is and how, how it was built in, uh, in the former years ago. And um, what is signaling data? Um, Matthias uh, showed before in, in, in one of the slides, uh, there are additional data sources and we are working with a lot of data sources. So I'm also in, in the research world, I'm working with, with Bluetooth data, with Wi-Fi data. So since uh, around about 15 years with every data source, which is possible to analyze the mobility of people or the transport of people, <coughs> this was the, the idea behind. And But what we are using now is really, we're using this signaling data based off the monitoring system of telcos. We are doing this not only in Austria as an additional information, we are doing this also in Slovenia, Serbia, Bulgaria, but we are doing this also, for example, in Germany. There we are getting the data from uh, the Telefonica O2. And um, the signaling data is it, it's very important how it's uh, really um, developed by a telco. So at the, at the end of the day, what we're using is triangulated data. So uh, you have an antenna, you have a device with the MC inside, and at the end of the day, we're calculating or this monitoring system, which, which is included in such a telco operator, is calculating um, the coordinate and the time tram, the timestamp of each mobile phone event. This could be data switched, uh, a packet switch, circuit switched in this case. And at the end of the day, for example, now in Austria, um, we have a mean of 1,200 coordinates per AMC per day. For example, uh, we are also allowed that we can um, exclude some some wide listed IMSIs in Austria for for different um, research work. And I have one of these IMSIs here, and uh, I'm, for example, generating around about 7,000, 8,000 coordinates per day, really timestamps, coordinates, uh, and events per day. So it, it, it's really a huge amount of data. Uh, but the topic is that um, the signaling data is not in this accuracy like people are thinking. Um, you're calculating based on the signal strength where the position of the of the device is. Um, but uh, as Matthias said before, um, the accuracy is, for example, in the inner city between zero and 200 meters of each mobile event. And in the rural area, for example, in Austria, we have the Alps and a lot of mountains. This could be also um, in, in case of 
five kilometers, 10 kilometers or 15 kilometers away. So the accuracy is quite always different. And But what we built here in Austria is uh, we built, uh, we call it mobility platform. <coughs> so we're using in a first step, uh, the way A1 data, um, the MZ is pseudo nominalized in the first way. We're using this data and uh, we are uh, then in the first step are dealing with a segmentation. So we are looking, for example, where the different events uh, um, have, for example, the possibility that there uh, is a stationary uh, topic of, of the MZ. And then in, in the second step, we are looking, uh, is there a segment, for example, over the day of this MZ that there could be a moving segment? And so we are um, at the end of the day um, making a segmentation of each um, pseudonymized ID, putting these pseudonymized IDs together and then calculating with additional data sources like real time tables from the public transport, spatial information um, and other data sources. We built a model that at the end of the day for the different branches, we um, provide different results based on the questions of them. For example, one branch could be tourism. Where are tourism moving in Austria? The uh, additional one could be um, like um, the spatial, uh, the, the population density. We are also providing population density maps uh, for different customers. And at the end of the day, we are really using um, this mobile phone data or signaling data here in Austria and also in the other countries um, to combine it with additional data sources then to analyze this, to implement it in our model. At the end of the day, we, are, we build an agent-based model for the whole country to extrapolate it also on the, the number of uh, people um, with, with weighting factors and then to provide it to different customers in some visualization way or also in some CSV tables and so on. And we are providing it, for example, also in Austria for the government in transportation statistics, how many um, trips per day people to have in different areas, uh, what is the trip length distribution and so on. So we're really providing then at the end of the day um, from customer asked uh, questions in case of which parameters we should analyze. So this is the, the process what we're doing here. Um, for us, for example, then it's a little bit different than in the Netherlands. Um, COVID was not really a bad topic for us as an Evenium because um, we had on the first weekend when, when the lockdown started in Austria, we had um, in the news some um, information, okay, people are tracked in Austria and so on. Uh, but we are working with this data since many years before. But the good thing was that we uh, really had a lot of discussions before uh, with all the stakeholders from data privacy, from data security, from NGOs in Austria, where we showed them many years before what we were doing and we got from them the approval, okay, we already know what we're doing. So also when you're doing this in COVID, it's quite okay. And at the end of the day, what we provided, for example, in Austria for the epidemiological model and OD metrics, and uh, they took the OD metrics of uh, the passenger trips and uh, correlated this with uh, the number of infections. And these are two uh, some, some showcases, I would say. The one topic is how is the really the mobility events and how was the lockdown works. And on the left side, this was very well known in, in, in Europe. Uh, we had Ischgl here and this is um, some, such an OD matrix where people are when they uh, leave um, Ischgl on this day when the lockdown started and where they are traveling over the day, for example. But what also very important was for us, because I'm really a transportation scientist and at the end of the day, I'm interested in, in transportation use cases. Uh, we built a mobility analytics um, platform where we, for example, can provide OD matrices on the municipality level and also a lower level, for example, for bigger cities like Vienna. And um, also there we can analyze trip length, number of trips and so on. And this is already included in our platform. And from this platform out, also we provide then different results to, to different uh, customers at the end of the day. Yes, this is a short introduction, what we are doing as, as in Venium in, in a nutshell. Um, now I will hand over to, to Reinhardt uh, and uh, he will start to, to give some, some insights about uh, the cooperation project, what we are doing together. Thank you, Matty. Um, 
The cooperation project between the three partners was um, started in or started in uh, 2018. Um, the goal was to analyze the passenger demands using uh, the anonymous floating phone data uh, for six different use cases. Um, we needed this for internal planning purposes at the uh, railway. And uh, for that, we had also to develop internal uh, analytic tools. Three partners are, as already mentioned, the Delco provider uh, and Telecom Austria, um, which has a market share uh, of about 38%. Uh, um, the Invenium, um, um, which creates and maintains and enhances the algorithm platform, and um, my company, the Railway ÖBB infrastructure, which uh, provides the actual train timetable time on a daily basis using our Aramis um, Advanced Railway Automation Management Information. Next slide, please. Yeah. The use cases um, um, are um, the most important use case for us was the entering and the exiting passengers per station. Um, then uh, another use case is the station-based OD matrix, also including the transfer passengers. Then uh, the loads of passengers on defined cross sections. We have the use case of uh, delays. Um, the OD matrix in the structure of the National Austria Austrian transport model. Then we have the catchment areas of station based on the home activity of the users and also um, certain special analysis um, like you can see on the right side of this slide, a special origin destination analysis of the airport in Vienna, where do the people travel to and where do they come from. Um, yes, uh, then some, some some insights from from my side because Matthias also told before uh, at the end of the day always uh, a model is behind such a topic. So um, only some some few words how for example to understand how our um, estimation of the moving segment I, I told before uh, is working. So what uh, you, you have to thank, for example, you have a smartphone and uh, in the morning your smartphone is doing some things, you make some updates, you're looking in and so on, and you're um, at the end of the day um, generating mobile phone events. And then you're traveling, for example, to the train station, from the train station in, with the train to the next train station, and then you're going to work. And um, in the first step, we're analyzing, okay, where are the stationary segments and where are the moving segments? Or for example, then in the second step, we are really estimating over the day with additional information and also with <coughs> um, some time information, uh, what could be, for example, this stationary segment B and what could be the moving segment B. And for example, the stationary segment could be if you are eight hours over the day on a certain position in this area or on a, in, in some zone, then um, for example, we're estimating 90% uh, that you're at work. This is, for example, one topic. And the other topic is for the moving segments. We're really taking uh, this um, moving segments <clears throat> and um, we're combining this, for example, based on the probabilistic model with the information of uh, the real timetable. So we know, for example, which train is uh, coming to the train station and then also leaving a train station and then to the next train station. And we built a model um, where we combine the information of the moving patterns of the signaling data together with the real timetable. Uh, there we have a, little, a lot of features and so on, and then we build such a machine learning model at, at the end of the day. And what we are then providing is really at the end of the day that um, we are estimating how many people are entering uh, based on this uh, really 
data of, of the mobile network, how many people are entering trains on such a train station and how many people are exiting also on this train station. And so what, what we were interested in really to have a whole process and at the end of today really to have um, a monitoring system which calculates based um, on the mobile phone data, extrapolated on the whole population, combining different data sources for a real tab table or also the road infrastructure and the rail infrastructure and then to provide results uh, to the ABB at the end of today. And this we're doing now, as uh, Reinhard said before, since 2018. But what very important is also, and this will now uh, explain also Reinhardt uh, to you, <clears throat> we are doing this also in case of that uh, we have a lot of empirical data from the ABB and based on this empirical data, uh, we also do a lot of validation of our results because this is very, very important. Yes, um, so we set up um, um, high quality assured empirical passenger count and the design and the organization and the implementation and validation is done uh, in my department. Um, so far, we already counted 120 stations uh, in Austria in the last years, um, since 2019. Uh, in fall, uh, in the last uh, months of 2022, we, all, um, we already uh, did, counted 22 sta uh, two stations, so we already have 142 stations. And uh, we al always had different size categories. We had um, different location, different features, like um, stations at the borders. So we had different um, different um, stations um, that we used to count and to um, to make uh, to help to improve the algorithm. Um, we needed a lot of staff for that, the counting staff, and um, we organized that with a um, with a daughter company of ÖBB, the ÖBB Werbung, um, which is ÖBB Commercials. Um, in the method uh, and the validation, it's very important for us that we are counting the entering and the exiting uh, passengers per train, um, because only that makes it possible to um, make the algorithm better. The counting staff uh, was specially trained um, to ensure a reliable, reliable and consistent counts. So um, we spend a lot of time to make trainings um, at the beginning of every counting. And uh, we all also had uh, one person um, from the staff who was tasked to manage this counting team. And um, every count of every train um, um, had, um, had, had, had a special quality index, like a mark from one to three or four. Um, so, that we can assure that um, the, the the confidence of of this certain count of this special number is high, and we filtered out the the bad or uh, the bad marks uh, counting. Yes. Um, then. This, this was Rana said before was very, very important. So we need a lot of empirical data to calibrate our models. Uh, we are now working on um, on version six. So that you see, we are really working on, on many years now to the topic really based on this empirical counting data to, um, yeah, develop new versions of the algorithms um, because to getting better and um, it, it's uh, because at the end of the day all the results we are providing based on a base station here in Austria uh, on not on a base station on on a uh, train station it's it's very important and it's also used in in different planning uh, areas and for example it was also used uh, as a monitoring system during the COVID topic and so at the end of the day it's it's very important that the results are, are valid and are also evaluated by additional data. Um, what we are now doing is really we are focusing to have different uh, modules to, to, to getting better um, and for example for all the 
doing what we're doing here and also, for example, what is done in other countries with the mobile phone data, it is really very important how the monitoring system of the signaling system works. Because at the end of the day, the accuracy of the mobile events um, is very important to have also at the end of the day, good raw data and to use this raw data then in combination with different data sources. So this is very important for us, for example, and it's also done and also uh, focused on the topic. Um, based on the mobile phone data, it works now quite really good. Um, on the next slide, uh, Rahat will also explain. Um, but we are focusing on in which areas we are not so good. For example, in in some border connection, uh, in some borders, it, it's not so easy really to to detect the right number of passengers which are exiting or entering the train. It's also not so easy sometimes. For example, if you're in very urban area, in, in Vienna is this the, the main line. Uh, that it's not really sometimes so easy to to match people on the one train station or another train station if the distance is, is very, very low in this case. Uh, but we're in a quite good way. Uh, we're working now on, on the new version number six uh, since now the last, uh, the, the last five years. We're dealing now also in case of how the new um, data stream based on 5G will also improve the quality um, of the topic here of the data. Um, we are thinking qu quite on a good way. We are a running system. I think this is also very important. We are providing every day the results of the day before and this now since uh, at the end of 2019. So have, you have really quite good uh, timeline and if the absolute value is not always in, in such high accuracy that you are only one, two or three or four per, um, percent away, um, you are in a relative um, time frame on, on a quite good level. This, this is also very important and then to combine it with, with, dif with different seasonal effects and so on. I um, want to give some more impact yeah. on the strengths and the weaknesses of um, our system. Um, the strength, uh, one of the strengths is that uh, the passenger demand is uh, continually calculated for the whole network using a consistent method. And we have um, the entire journey from origin to destination, which gives us a lot of opportunities um, <clears throat> to uh, get out the results that we want. And these results are available for different time aggregations too. For weekends, for example, we can use it for events. We have yearly variation curves and a lot of other possibilities. We can distinct uh, different train categories like uh, commuter trains or um, intercity trains. Um, and dur during the pandemic, um, it showed that this uh, method is um, um, very good and fully automated and it was the only thing that really um, produced data because uh, manual counts were not really possible during the pandemic. Um, and um, high quality results we get for medium and high categorized station. And um, um, when we come to the weaknesses, on the other hand, we can say that we have low quali quality results for low categorized stations that you see on the picture. Um, less than 200 first passengers per day. There it's um, difficult because um, one or two or let's say five persons can make a real difference there. Um, the quality improvement improvements are very much also depending on the cellular network expansions, which we cannot, um, um, we, which we, we, have, we don't have a really uh, possibility to um, Improve. And uh, well, another difficulty is, uh, is in the different differentiation of parallel traffic traffic flows. Um, this affects some stations with nearby roads, for example. And another weakness is that we um, will um, always have to make our validation counts for the future algorithm improvement and. This means, of course, that um, we have to we have to um, have to make um, um, resources, and we have to have resources, and we have to have money for these uh, people who are counting for us. 
Um, another interesting um, thing is um, which practical applications do we already have for our data? Um, one of the most important um, uh, is this um, chart that you can see here. Um, this is um, the statistic of passengers uh, throughout the pandemic. It was created for the top management at the LBB and for the CEO. You can see that um, yeah. the, the numbers crashed down um, at about minus 80 percent uh, in the beginning of the pandemic. Um, it crashed down at, but at about 80 percent and now it's recovering. Um, right now we are already in in the plus areas in the plus uh, percentages, uh, especially the, the intercity trains recovered more than the, the regional and the commuter trains. Uh, this data was also a basis for the argumentation to ensure a continued train operation between Vienna and Salzburg um, <clears throat> during the pandemic, because um, this um, this line is usually not um, um, subsidized from the state, and this was the argumentation that uh, the state had to put money to um, order and to pay for the for the trains during the pandemic, because. Uh, passengers crashed down at about 80 percent, as I mentioned. The aggregated data that we get here is also used uh, for the internal planning purposes here. It's probably the most important uh, use case for us here in my department. We are also creating individualized reports that we are sharing with other departments in the ÖBB infrastructure. And we are already recognizing that the um, the wish for and wish for this data and to get data and special analysis is um, growing in our company and federal uh, railways. Um, so data is also used as an input factor for the national Austrian transport model. And um, since um, the beginning of the year, we also have a pilot project um, to supply this data. Um, to rail operating companies um, like um, our own LBB um, passenger company. And we have this um, pilot project with this with our uh, with our own uh, passenger company. Yeah, so that was the end of our presentation. We will get the answer some questions our project. Great, thank you, Michael, and thank you, Reinhard, for uh, this uh, interesting presentation. Uh, this is a use case that seems like it's working and it's uh, working well, so it's great to see a successful use case. Uh, I'd like to open the floor for questions if you have anything. I see uh, Tiziana in the chat is asking, uh, are your modules and algorithms open source? Um, if anyone else is uh, having a question, please feel free to raise your hand now. Uh, but so I'll, I'll pass that question over to yeah. you, uh, Michael and Reinhard. Yeah, no, 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 it's not open source. So it's um, it's really uh, part of the company, I would say. And this is uh, this algorithms we are developed here is part of the cooperation project between the A1 Invenium and the UBB. Um, so we developed it. Um, a lot of the, the things we did here, we started at the university and it's already some parts are published, but not the whole process is published. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Latifa as well. Yes, so, so we spoke about some challenges regarding uh, uh, parallel traffic flows. So so yeah. in, in the city of Dubai, some we have, I think, same challenges when you look at uh, the, how close the metro line is with, with the road network. So did you find any way to, to solve this issue or are you planning to uh, work on, on, on this in the future? Yeah, we're still working, so it's an ongoing process, but it works quite good. 
for example, the, the topic is uh, if you have a metro, a metro is always a little bit different because metro have, um, you have specific base stations for metros. So a metro topic is a little bit more easier, it's easier than the railway topic we are doing here in the urban and rural area. Um, but um, at the end of the day, um, we have some time windows where we are mapping people if they are, for example, um, on the train or not on the train. Um, so we have a lot of different features uh, implemented in our model at the end of the day. If we are matching um, IMSIs on or IDs really on the train or not on the train. And we have different parameter setting for rural area, for inner city areas. We have different parameter settings for um, the same train station category and so on. So we have a lot of parameters and settings how we can do this. Um, there are some train stations which are a little bit difficult because if you have, for example, some traffic signal system here and traffic signal system here, and you have the road and the rail on a similar way, um, sometimes it's a little bit different. Uh, we know that, uh, but uh, what we are uh, using then at the end of the day is we, we take a little of additional data, we are calibrating different train stations on an individual level, and then it works quite good. But at the end of the day, you have also false matchings. So th th this with every time will be there. So, but it's an ongoing process at the end of today. Yeah. Thanks again. Uh, I have a question if you don't mind. Um, Reinhard, you mentioned this is being used as input to the Austrian transport model. Um, is this a what does Statistics Austria think about this work? Is this something that they're going to consider using in the future, do you think? Or is it more experimental data, less official statistics? Thanks. Yeah, it's, it's a difficult question because I think it's an ongoing process um, because um, the data is not, not really published um, not even really published in our company, and um, it's an, I think it's an ongoing process um, that um, um, yeah that we have the commitment to to use the data uh, more and more, and it's also the question uh, it, it's, for example it's the question we ho we already have statistics and entering and exiting passengers from other sources in other um, companies and other statistics, uh, transport statistics, and um, of course they are quite different. There are differences, and what is the what is the ranking? What what are the difference? These are questions that um, that come up, of course, because um, when we see uh, a station has a certain number of um, a certain number of passengers. In the last years, and we now take our number from the from our analysis, and there are there are some differences. Then we we always need to explain uh, the differences, and we also see that um, at the management dashboard for the CEO, um, he already he, um, he's watching this um, every week, and he's also asking questions. Um, from his experience, um, he thinks there are differences. Why has Vienna, for example, um, why is the why is the number in Vienna in Vienna so smaller than he thought? Uh, why why are other numbers different? And I think it's it's a longer process to to get um, um, yeah, to get the confidence and. Uh, um, to 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 declare the declare all the um, differences between the between the different uh, statistics and yeah I'm not really sure what the the, the public transport office in Austria um, what 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 the the meaning uh, what what the what's the what they say or uh, what they think about the about the, the data. Perhaps, Maggie, you can also add something <laughs> to this question. 
Yeah, so we are providing the data, for example, this is very specific use case. So the UPV was interested as a railway operator for the infrastructure, how many people, what they're doing. Um, we are providing, this data is also provided from the UPV to the Ministry of Transport. So the Ministry of Transport, the government has it. Uh, the statistics office has it not. So I... It, it, it's not my part here, but it is always a little bit of discussion, I would say, why the one ministry has it and the other one has it not in this case. Um, so it, it's always a topic also, for example, we're providing Ministry A with results, Ministry B with results, Ministry C with results. Um, we always had the idea to build, for example, some, some whole mobility observer where the government, for example, gets our results in such an aggregated way because the raw data is, is in Austria here not possible. <coughs> These are different things why it's not possible. But I think we are now really on the way uh, to show with different use cases how acceptable the data result is here at this case and also how the different parameters and results are possible to use in different statistics. And I think we are we're not on the point that uh, different agencies are saying, OK, that's the perfect parameter, that's the perfect data source, use it. So we are really now on the way to build based on different use cases, the acceptance in the different uh, stakeholder topics that they're using really in future this data source. So I think we are really in, in the process here and an ongoing process. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any more uh, <coughs> questions uh, to you, uh, Michael and Reinhard in the ch uh, chat, unless anyone wants to raise their hand. If not, then what I would like to do is just summarize what was discussed today and where we take it from here. So I think we've heard two very interesting examples today, one from the side of CBS and the limited use case uh, that involves uh, goodwill. And I saw the in the chat, Sam Rose from the Department for the Transport in the UK is asking if any other countries have examples of uh, this goodwill operator use case. And so please feel free to write to us about that. And then the Austrian case of a very specific use case in public transport, uh, and it's working. And you're, you're producing data on this that may feed into the Austrian transport model. Whether that becomes official statistics in the future seems like it's an open question. Um, in addition to this, uh, going forward, we would like to organize uh, similar calls on, like this on other use cases. Uh, what we've mentioned so far is walking and cycling, uh, traffic origin destination matrices, and maybe transport planning as well. Uh, but we're interested in uh, countries' views on this. What else should we be doing? Do you want to get involved? Uh, if you have any feedback on this session, uh, in the next two minutes, perhaps we can discuss this or if uh, Latifa or Esperanza want to mention anything now, uh, they can do. Um, Alex, uh, I think um, you're at a good path uh, in terms of um, inviting uh, countries to share experiences. Maybe what I just want to mention is that you know, this work and transport is in the context of the task team on mobile phone big data. So um, one thing that we discussed when we were in Indonesia is that if there's a possibility for a use case, for example, on one area of statistics, we don't want to use it only for one area of statistics because data is very hard to access. So we want to leverage on other types of statistics where mobile phone big data could be used. So for example, if there's one um, possibility to do it for tourism, then we should also explore uh, trans uh, use of this data for transport or for information society. So I think this is some sort of a promise that if we have an issue on data access, uh, we as a group should help each other uh, to uh, take advantage of the data that could be available at the country level and use it for at least the six areas that uh, Alex mentioned uh, earlier in his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Esperanza. 
Uh, Latifa, did you have any final remarks? No, just uh, would love to see some more faces to our task team group. So please uh, email Alex and, and hope to see you and, and, and taking some of these discussions further and, and working together in terms of uh, developing better data for official statistics or to enhance our uh, smart cities and, and the countries that we work for. Great point. Yes, let me emphasize that if you do want to get involved in our task team, please do email me. Uh, it, there's no obligation, but uh, we would very much welcome you uh, uh, if you want to stay aware of what other countries are doing in this field. Uh, with that, I'd like to end the call. Thank you very much to our uh, presenters from Austria and the Netherlands, and uh, we'll be in touch. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye. Yeah.